We are featuring this hour an interview with Dr. Christopher Busby, an expert on radiation in Fukushima, who has been very outspoken about the dangers of even low levels of ionizing radiation from not just the Fukushima disaster, but um, other radiological events. And he joins us by Skype now to give us the latest breakdown on radiological weapons, a little bit of update on Fukushima, and uh, some thyroid problems in children, a few other points as well. Welcome to the show, Dr. Busby. Yes, hello. I'm talking to you from Riga. I, I, I headed off to the woods, and I'm now in the woods in, in, in my little house in Latvia. Oh, really? Um, and what I, yeah, what I want to talk to you about, really, I mean, it's my main thing, but I, I, I'll just plug it again, is, is what I see as the, and what actually is, the biggest human health uh, public health scandal of all time, which is which is this um, release to the environment by by scientists since 1945 of all these radio radioactive substances like strontium 19, plutonium 239, and cesium 137, and all that. And this whole umbrella uh, um, of, of this this radiological public health scandal covers all of the things that I've researched in the last 20 years: Fukushima, Chernobyl, uh, nuclear uh, increases in childhood cancer near nuclear sites, uh, contaminated sea. There's a, a, we've done work on the Baltic Sea, on the Irish Sea, and most most recently, of course, I've been involved in looking at. Uh, depleted uranium and, and even uh, 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 some kind of new enriched uranium weapon which has been deployed uh, by the Israelis in Lebanon and also uh, in, in Fallujah as we found out and published in the literature. So it's, it's made me public enemy number one of course amongst the people who plug nuclear power stations. Well I'm sure. But, but if, if you look at the sources of all this, so you're talking about not only nuclear power but nuclear weapons testing obviously. Uh, do, do you get into uh, nuclear uh, medical exposure? Well, nuclear medical exposure is mostly external, and this is, uh, and I, I think it, it, it's it's quite relevant for me to point out that 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 it's not about low level radiation. The argument is not about low level radiation. It's about um, external and internal radiation because actually, uh, radiation is measured in in various units, millisieverts and millirads and these these units relate to energy that's transferred to the human body so it's a, it's a it's a it's a physics based unit that is used and the problem is the big problem is that it doesn't work for internal radionuclides and uh, and I, and i can briefly explain why the 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 transfer of external energy like gamma rays into the body is the same as sitting in front of the fire and heating yourself and warming yourself up you can take get so many joules per kilogram of your body uh, in terms of heat energy but but you could get the same number of joules per kilogram into your body if you reached into the fire and you ate a hot coal. And that's a very, a very reasonable analogy with the difference between stand, standing somewhere where the radioactivity level is slightly higher. So you've got external radiation like from an x-ray machine or something like that, mm -hmm. which is actually not, it may be low level radiation, but it's not a big deal. But, but then ingesting or inhaling radioactive iodine, like for instance from Fukushima or, or, or particles of depleted uranium from some weaponized use in, in Iraq, those things, uh, these, those, those tiny, tiny particles and the internal radionuclides that damage the DNA, they are the serious problem. And that is the biggest public health scandal of all time. So, and it's, uh, uh, yes, sorry. Go no, on, I, yeah. I just wanted to ask you the question. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so externally, the, uh, the, the radioactive particles, you're, you are subject to them via the inverse square law of yeah, distance, yeah, exactly. right? Yeah, so just like, yeah, just like sitting internal, in front of the light. Yeah. Right. But then internally, your distance to the particle is zero. Absolutely so. Be and a lot of these particles are alpha emitters too, which, which normally an alpha particle wouldn't pass through your skin. But, but uranium, for example, plutonium, they're alpha, alpha emitters and they're sitting inside you. And so they only have a very short range and they damage, they, they produce enormous local doses to, to, to cells. So it isn't at all low level radiation. But the con is this, that the nuclear industry, or, or in fact the military who started this way back in the 50s, the, the, the con is that they dilute all of that energy into the whole body. Body, whereas actually the energy is all in one place, usually right. on the DNA. Yeah. Uh, the, in terms this of, is outrageous. Well, in terms of internal sources, uh, this is fascinating. I've got a lot of questions for you already, but in, in your assessment, is it a higher risk of internal exposure through inhalation of airborne particles, or is it yes. through eating food 
No, that no, it's more. For, it is more it's from inhalation. inhalation. Inhalation, and the reason is quite simple: that over in, over evolutionary timescales, the the gut has uh, found that ways of excluding a lot of these radionuclides, because a lot of them, there are a lot of natural radionuclides, like radium and uranium, um, uh, thorium, and and daughters of these substances, which occur naturally. And the gut seems to be quite clever at keeping a lot of this stuff out. But if it's inhaled, it gets into the lungs. It goes through the lungs into the into the uh, th tracheobronchial lymph nose and then the lymphatic system can take it anywhere and, and in particular where it takes it is to the female breast because that's quite close by and so these particles get into the female breast so we find high levels of breast cancer uh, in in people who live downwind or close to nuclear power stations for example I mean there's an awful lot of hoo-ha about childhood leukemia near nu nuclear power stations but nobody's been looking at adults who live near a nuclear power station for the simple reason that the ca cancer registries refuse to release the, release the data. <laughs> not um, so not we've, had, we've had to knock on doors in order to do these studies. So which, which radiological um, isotopes are more likely to be airborne? For example, downwind from Fukushima, is, is someone likely to inhale uh, a particle of cesium? No, 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 uranium. Um, Just uranium. All, all, all of, yes, all, all of the effects in, in, in Iraq are a consequence of the use of uranium weapons. Uh, I don't say depleted uranium weapons because we've actually measured this stuff and we found that since about 2003, since the second Gulf War, that they've been using ordinary uranium or even slightly enriched uranium, which is something which is a bit, bit odd, which we don't quite understand. And it may well be, and I've suggested this, a consequence of, of a new type of weapon, which is, a, which is a fusion weapon. But, I mean... Well, whether, whether that's true or not, certainly uranium is the thing that's going, that is causing the effects uh, in, in Iraq. And, and my feeling is probably uranium particles are what causes the effects downwind of nuclear power stations. Because at the end of the day, it's, uranium is what they run on. Uranium is what they run on. I mean, I've, I've done a number of studies, for example, up in, uh, in America, around near Los Angeles, around the, the um, Santa Susana site there, the field laboratory, where people are all dying like flies all around there, and nobody seems to figure out how it works. But if you look through the data, if you look through the environmental reports of Boeing and Rocketdyne, who are the people who are, run the operation, you find that there's enormous amounts of enriched uranium in the air filters. But nobody looks at uranium because it's kind of thought to be natural and somehow therefore safe. But of hmm. course the particularized version of it is certainly not natural and it's certainly not safe. What, what isotopes of uranium are, are, you, uh, are likely to be airborne and what, what kind of half-life are we talking about there? Well, the half-life is, is, is uh, 4.7 bi um, billion years. I mean, oh, well, that's, uh, that's a little more than a human lifespan. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of quite a long time, the uranium. In fact, uranium is the problem that they, that, that they have when they try to bury nuclear waste. I mean, another study that I've done is to, is to look at the, um, the Swedish uh, 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 proposals to, to build a nuclear waste site underneath the Baltic Sea which is already the most radioactive sea in the world. And by the time all of the other radionuclides like cesium and strontium and all the short-lived stuff has gone away, the uranium and the radium is still there. Because those things have enormously long half-lives. They have geological half-lives. Mm -hmm. But of course the particles won't stay there forever. The particles uh, are produced in, when the weapons are used and they go up in the air and then they land in the desert and they hang around for quite a long time. And my feeling they still are there. I was in Iraq in 2001. I went there with Al Jazeera, a lot of measuring equipment and everything, and I found a lot of depleted uranium particles there uh, from the first Gulf War. So really? that was like 10 years later. Yeah. Well, actually. we also see in the veterans who are around the DU weapons, they, they are exhibiting very high rates of cancer, and I think you even That's mentioned... That's true. That's true. Yes. I, I, I've, done some, I've done some studies. Um, I've been called in as an expert recently on, on, a, on a number of United Kingdom veterans who were deployed in the second Gulf War and the first Gulf War, and they, they, they were basically cleaning out vehicles that had been struck by depleted uranium bullets. And they've got, uh, they've got uh, lymphomas and they've got uh, colon cancer too. And there are two of them with colon cancer, and the odds against that happening, I can tell you, uh, at the age, because they're, they're both 40, at that age, the odds against it, uh, both of them uh, getting colon cancer is one in uh, 780,000. <laughs> that, that's wow. the lifetime odds. So, so it's quite obviously the uranium that's caused the colon cancer. But, but the government and the military, they just refuse to concede all of this stuff, and well, it's impossible to do any research because the cancer registries won't release the data.
Right, right. The this is the this is a global cover up, but it's also easy to sweep under the rug because so many of the symptoms of radiological poisoning are the they they can be diagnosed as something different and that's, the symptoms can take a long time to be diagnosable. Well, that's the main problem. It's like stabbing somebody and then they die 20 years later. Right. Uh, and so it's quite hard to do those sorts of cases. But it's not. It's getting easier, I have to say. Um, the, the, the problem also, of course, is this. Uh, that in the last 10 years, we've realized a lot more about the way in which radio... There's been a lot of research done. Uh, and, and this hasn't fed through into the people who... who regulate the limits and so on. But anyway, what, what we've found out is that radiation doesn't just give you cancer. It gives you heart attacks. It, 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 it damages your children. It, uh, it more or less increases the rate of just about every illness that there is. So it's a kind of premature aging. Yeah, and, like, a, like and, and, a stealth epidemic. Yeah. So, so if, we're, if you're looking, I mean, for instance, if you want to do a study and you look for, you look for increases in cancer, you won't only find increases in cancer, and because of that, you don't find as high an increase in cancer as you might predict. And the reason is that people die of something else before they get cancer. Uh, cancer cancer's an old age. It's something that increases uh, um, Dr. exponentially Busby, with age. We are going to take a quick break. Uh, here, here's my question. It seems like the defense industry, or the, the weapons industry, let's call it, has a very deeply uh, inve uh, vested interest in protecting its investment in nuclear products and also the nuclear power industry so you've got these two very powerful industries that want this truth to remain a secret it seems and and it seems like you're you're knocking heads with these two industries quite frequently yes that's right uh, I actually in the um, in the fifties is when it really got bad and that's when it all started because they wanted to like as you say they wanted to to, to um, test nuclear weapons in the atmosphere and it was quickly becoming apparent that this was killing people so what they did was that they forced they, they, they forced all of this information underground and by 1959 there was an agreement between the World Health Organization and the the International Atomic Energy Agency, whereby all of the research into this, um, the health effects of radiation, uh, of the type of radiation I'm talking about, um, w was put into the hands of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Now, I, I also, and, and this still goes on, because I was in, I was in Brussels talking about the, um, we would made a petition. Incidentally, there is something that people can do about this. So we have a website which we set up last year called uh, nuclearjustice.org. We, we formed the, an international committee for nuclear justice in Vilnius, Lithuania. And so this, this is some, people can get in touch with us. There are petitions that can be used uh, based on human rights. Anyway, my point is, I went, I went to, to Brussels to, to make an intervention on behalf of the Green Group of the European Parliament. Um, and I was, I was talking about this whole issue, and what I learned there was that the, the, new, the new radiation protection legislation which is going through, which I was asked to go and talk about, is going to be put in the hands of the people who are, in, in the hands of the industry rather than the hands of the Environment Committee, because they have these different committees in the European Union. Um, and they have a, a committee that's involved in environment and health, and they have another committee that's involved, or directorate, that's involved in... Um, in uh, uh, looking after industry. So it's the industry committee who's going to be dealing with the legislation relating to radiation. And this is exactly like it happened in the 50s where they gave the, the protection of human beings and the protection of the environment into the hands of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Right, and turn it over to the very people who are the problem. Exactly, exactly. But you know, I, I mean, I was very interested earlier on in your list of, and I, I quite went along with a lot of that stuff. You know, the, the if, what I would call the Sovietization of, of of the planet, actually. Yeah. Because although the Soviet Union has collapsed, all, all of the things that the Soviet Union went in for, all of this airbrushing of history and and the the teaching of nonsense and. Uh, all the things that you talk about have now have now become mainstream in the United States and and certainly in my country in England as well too. Well, so right. you really, basically, if you want to learn something, you go to the internet, uh, and and then you just have to kind of sift through all the crazy s stuff. But basically, you get a much better idea of what's going on than if you listen to the news or if you look in the newspaper. Well, I think that this uh, nuclear industry is this is a classic example of where they are attempting to destroy actual knowledge, destroy history, and and spoon feed you a new narrative that is at odds with physical reality, or in this case, actual physics. Yeah, well, the, th the thing, I've thought a lot about this, and um, I, I, I've concluded 
the, I mean, because you have to either think, well, they're just bad people or evil or something, and you have to think, how can they possibly go in for all of this nonsense? So and then you can say, well, they might have a lot of money, people give them money in brown envelopes and all this, and there's probably a bit of that happens as well. But my feeling is that it's a way of looking at the world, and this way of looking at the world ar arrived in the last century with science itself. And, it, and in some way, science itself, especially physics, actually, uh, physicists seem to be able to believe stuff that everybody thinks is manifest nonsense, <laughs> and, they, and they and they can somehow control they can control the way in which the world works by by saying, well, look, we're much cleverer than you are, and you have to listen to what we say because we can do mathematics and you can't. <laughs> yeah, and and, and most of the people, and like the politicians who are all stupid anyway, you know, or most of them, that they're, they're, they're they're desperate to show that they're as clever as the physicists. Yeah. So it's kind uh, of Doctor Mosby, stay, stay with us. We got to go to a quick break here. But just before the break, Dr. Busby mentioned that there are some, um, let's say, uh, fundamental themes of, of conventional science that, that uh, he believes are, are not uh, legitimate, or I'm paraphrasing. But I'd like to ask you about that, Dr. Busby. What, what are the things about modern science that uh, you think need to be questioned? Well, uh, I think the problem is that, that science became a very, very powerful machine. Um, from, its in, from, from when it began, probably in about the 15th century, uh, and it was based on empirical evidence. So what happened is that, that rather than just come out and say, this is so, because, because the, the church teaches that it's so, let's have a look and see whether it works. And so they'd do an experiment, and the experiment would show whatever it showed. And very often that would be, uh, that would be, that would be something that wasn't expected, and they would have to rejig re the whole understanding of reality to fit in with experimental work. Yes. And you remember Galileo. Galileo was challenged by the Inquisition because he said that there were the moons of Jupiter. And in the Bertolt Brecht play of Galileo, he actually shows the Inquisitors at, at, through his telescope the moons of Jupiter. And, and they say, as I recall, they say, well, um, these, this must be a very uncertain machine and we don't really believe in this machine if it shows something that cannot exist. <laughs> right. right? So well, anyway, clear. the yeah. point is that that's exactly the situation we have now. We have have, uh, for example, many, many studies that show that there's an increase in childhood leukemia around nuclear sites. But the nuclear, uh, but the, the radiation risk uh, organizations, the United Nations uh, Scientific Committee, the United Na in the United States, the, the, the various committees there, NRC and so on, and, in, uh, and the International Committee uh, on Radiological Protection, which was based in Sweden, is now based in Canada. These committees are, are, are controlling the understanding of the health effects of radiation and they continue to act exactly like the Inquisition. They say, yes. well, these childhood leukemias cannot exist because we know that they cannot exist because our, 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 our formulae say that they cannot exist. And well, that's the situation we're in now. That's, ex that's exactly it. I, I, I've talked about this as well. The, the scientific method I is predicated on the idea that you must assess all the available evidence and then Absolutely. sort it out. You can't filter selectively the evidence that you don't like because it disagrees with your preconceived notion of what the theory is. But that's, that's right. what we see. Well, there are two philosophical uh, rules here. There's the rules of induction and the rules of deduction. So what they say is that they know how much cancer is caused by radiation on the basis of experiments that have been done on the survivors of the Hiroshima bomb. Okay, and that was all external radiation, and it was a very big dose. And therefore, on the basis of that theory, this, and this is a formula, this is an equation, okay? Mathematics, we're back to mathematics. On the basis of this mathematical equation, it's impossible that these children, you know, the nuclear sites, could, could have their cancers or, or, uh, as a consequence of radiation. And the same thing happens with Fukushima. We have the World Health Organization now came out with a big document recently that said that the effects of the Fukushima accident, because the doses were so small are not even going to be measurable and and in the middle of all this people people are having 40 percent increase in no no that 40 percent of the people of the children tested have got thyroid nodules people are just falling down dead all over the place and there's lots of evidence that they're covering it all up so and, and this is exactly like galileo this is this is a failure right. of science itself Sci in, in many ways I, I agree with you in many ways modern science has become the new dogmatic church that that science originally fought against because we're supposed to be based on actual evidence. I remember having a conversation recently with uh, a physicist just about the table of elements and, and uh, I asked about mercury and 
and how toxic was mercury and he spelled it out for me oh this is extremely toxic a potent neurotoxin and toxic to biology at many many different levels and, and and then I asked him I said well so what do you think about injecting children with trace amounts of mercury and he said no that's extremely dangerous should never be done it's not human I said well what about injecting a child with a, a vaccine and he said oh well it's okay in that case yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> well, you know that the, the, prob the problem. I, th I mean, I, actually, I have to blame Einstein for this, because we, if you go back far enough, what you find is that the, the, that in Victorian science was generally understood. It was like common sense. But then, round about the 1920s, like between 1905, when when they came out with special relativity, through to about 1930, the whole thing was turned on its head, and suddenly we had to believe stuff that was manifestly impossible. And 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 the people who went to the top of, of of the lists who, who said these things were the physicists, the, the mathematical physicists. And if you look, if you look in government now, if you look in the UK government, you look in American government, you look all over the place, you look in the European Union, you find that the people who are the advisors, the senior advisor to government, are always mathematical physicists, and those are people who can believe virtually anything. Hmm. Now, some, somebody should point out to them that they appear to have lost 95 percent of the universe as a result of their <laughs> the dark calculations. You know? right. Exactly so. You know? yes. and we have to believe these guys when they tell us that these radiation effects effects are, are, are harmless when well, in fact we see in front of our in every study that we do that people are dying all over the place well, how about it's, when, it's terrible when, when they say they've discovered the God particle but all it is is a statistical anomaly it's not first of all it's not a particle and it's not God and it's a statistical uh, it, you know it's it's it they didn't really find something that you can look at. It's not even at. that. It's not yeah. even that. The point right. is, when they do these experiments, what they do is they don't actually see anything. Right. What they do is they have a huge computer program which analyzes all of the stuff that's going on inside this, this machine that they've got, where they're smashing things together at enormous energies. And then they apply all of the equations that they've figured out long ago are the right equations. And they come out with answers, which, which may or may not be right. But maybe the equations are wrong in the first place. That's the point. Yeah. It's all mathematical. It's exactly like the the analysis of the health effects of radiation where it's a mathematical equation it says it can't happen so they say it's impossible mm -hmm. and yet there's some dead person sitting in front lying in front of them in the road and they say well this person cannot exist just like the, the like Galileo and the Inquisition anyway we have to do something about it you know we have we have to stop believing these physicists we have to start taking control of this whole area and getting hold of the information itself I mean why is it that the cancer registries are allowed to re refuse to release data about the levels of cancer around nuclear plants or around areas where there's radiation. Why? Yeah. I mean, it, it must be. It, it, it's a lot politically of vested wrong. interest. Well, in addition to your site, nuclearjustice.org, is there another website where people can uh, stay up to date with your investigations? Yes, yes, there is. Well, the, the, there, are, there are a couple of websites that, that they should look at. One, one is the Low Level Radiation Campaign website, which is llrc.org, Low Level Radiation Campaign. And if, they want to, and if they want to look at the work I've done, they look at the Green Audit. So it's www.greenaudit.org. So those two websites have most of the stuff that we are we are doing. If they look on my Wikipedia entry, incidentally, they will find that I'm every sort of scurrilous, you know, um, idiot. Because <laughs> the, the nuclear industry have a whole team of people that, that spend their whole time cut, cutting me down on the internet oh, and course. putting, up, putting yeah. up all sorts of, you know. Yeah, and I just trolls. don't have the time. I don't have the time to deal with it all. You know, I'd have to have a whole department of people just checking. No, so my Wik Wikipedia entry is a sort of battle of the song. Wikipedia is largely discredited on anything that 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 threatens uh, uh, corporate interests. Yeah, they, the teams of trolls work work on that. But I want to get back because you mentioned the history of of physics and the development of much of this knowledge base. You know, if you look back to the early physicists who were, who were uh, investigating radiation, you know, uh, even at the time, they said it wasn't dangerous. And a lot of them died from cancer, like Curie and, and, and many others who were experimenting and, and even trying to isolate, as up to that point, unknown elements in the table of elements. They, they died from right. radiation poisoning. Yes, and they, they, a lot of them burned their, their arms off and, and got cancer as yes. a result of, of yes. using those x-ray tubes and so on. And somehow we're led to believe that everything is okay. Anyway, the point is that if you look at the at the limits, the dose limits, if you go right back to that early time and look at the dose limits and, what, and watch them through the whole of the last century, you find they go down and down and down and down and down and down exponentially. And eventually, in 1990 or so, they hit the one millisievert level, which is the legal limit today. But the reason they don't go down any further 
further, which of course they should do, the reason they don't go down any further is because the nuclear industry wouldn't be able to function and the military wouldn't be able to function uh. if, that, if, if, if that went down any further. But as I said before, you know, that the important thing is not the, the actual radiation dose, it's, it's where it's from, it's what it's from. We have, we have places in the world now which have become absolutely dangerous to live near and this is what nuclear justice is about. It's, it's to try and use human rights legislation to, to raise that issue because can, we can have you the Baltic Sea. Can you tell us some of those geographical locations? Yes, yes. We, uh, the, it's, where, it's, it's places where radioactivity has accumulated. So you've got quite a few of them in America. You've got the Han Hanford site uh, in Washington. You've got, um, you, you've got Oak, is it Oak Ridge. You've got San certainly, certainly Los Angeles, Santa Sa uh, up in northwestern uh, Sa Santa Susana, up in the Simi Hills there. That's an area which is massively contaminated with radioactivity from the, fr from the rocket dine operation. And the, there was an explosion there in 1959. I think it is from the, from the sodium reactor, which 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 melted down and and spewed stuff all over the place. That's that's quite a dangerous place. So the Irish Sea uh, and the Baltic Sea. Yes. Well, sorry, sorry to interrupt, on. but but uh, I want to understand how 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 do these radioactive particles get kicked up into the air? Is it from wind? Is it a farmer yeah. plowing a field? How, how a does it happen? That, that's a, well, all of those things. But but actually, um, if we were to go to, for instance, the Los Angeles one. Uh, it, it's caused by disturbing the soil. So what they've been doing there since about 1995 to 2005, they were knocking down buildings and, and remediating the land mm. and trucking a lot of this stuff out on trucks. And of course, it just generated vast amounts of dust. Right. Actually, farmers, for example, if you take farmers, the highest, the highest rates of, um, of leukemia and lymphoma in terms of occupations are from farmers because, of course, they, they, they plow up the fields and that's got all the weapons fallout on them. Then the other, a very interesting one, which is certainly uh, going to affect people in Japan, is what's called sea to land transfer. If you if you, if you dump all this radionuclide stuff into the sea, what happens is it, is it uh, adheres to the surface. It adsorbs on the surface of clays and fine particles. Uh -huh. And so when the, when the waves crash into the beach and you get those white horses, those bubbles turn inside out and they force this stuff up into the air. And there's this phenomenon called sea to land transfer, which is quite well um, described in the literature. I mean, people have measured plutonium by distance from the sea in the Irish Sea. And... Uh, basically, people living within about one kilometer, kil kilometer from the sea get a much higher level of cancer. Uh, uh -huh. And I've done, stu I've done studies that show that. And that's why, because they inhale this stuff from the sea to land transfer. And that's going to affect people all along the east coast of Japan. It certainly affects people in the Irish Sea, where Sellafield releases this stuff into the Irish Sea. And it will affect people in the Baltic Sea, too, Dr. from Dr. studies. Dr. Busby, up. is there a, a handheld radiation detection device that a consumer could use to determine whether such particles are airborne near them? No, not really, not no. Not sensitive enough? Uh, for, for, no, because the, it's, 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 it's for the same reason that I said that the do, what, 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 the, what the handheld radiation detector does, it, no matter how sensitive it is, is it measures dose. So it can only average over the, the, the size of the machine that's uh, being used, you right. see. And so these little particles wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't have any effect on that. You, I mean, there are ways in which you can deal with it, but they're a bit complicated. You have to get sticky filters. So you put up some uh, sellotape on, on a piece of paper, and then it sticks to the sellotape, and then you can put something called, you can put a plastic on there called CR39, and then you can see the tracks when you, when you, when you or, or, or you can put um, photographic film as really? well. And in fact, a, a colleague of mine in, in America, in the United States, uh, looked at some of the dust uh, uh, from f from Fukushima and was able to image these particles quite quite easily. Well, is there, it seems critical, really, for especially people living near these areas that you identify as possibly having h high levels of latent uh, radioactive particles, to be able to have some kind of a device or something they can purchase well, to to determine whether I, I, they're safe. I agree with you. I agree with you. But the, but the, basically there isn't anything. I mean, hmm. all you can do is you can you can bulk this stuff. So so what you can do is you can look at vehicle air filters, for example, which is what I did in Fukushima. Uh -huh. I got a lot of Japanese people to send me their, their the filters from their from their motor cars. Uh -huh. And then what we did is we measured the in bulk. We measured the concentrations of material in the, in those filters. And one filter I got sent by a lady in central Tokyo. So she was, she was uh, living in a, an apartment which was 300 meters from the Tokyo Tower. And she sent me her air conditioning filter, which was inside the room 
that she lived in. So it was inside. It, it uh -huh. just circulated air inside the room. And there was about 120,000 becquerels per kilogram of cesium in that filter. There was a lot of uranium-235, uranium-238. There was uh, lead-210, which nobody had detected. Obviously, a lot of lead-210 was coming out of Fukushima. So that was quite... And I put, a, I put up a video I put up a video on YouTube about that. It's, it's quite a scary business, because this is Tokyo, population oh. 36 million. Yeah, and the, the really scary thing is that your lungs are the filter. I mean, if, if, if course, you're walking well, around breathing in that area, you you are accumulating all that in your lungs. That's the whole that's course, your whole point. That's that's my point. I mean, uh, we 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 can't take somebody's lung out and measure it, but we okay. can certainly take a filter out of a car and measure it. And so, if the filter it in, intercepts material as it gets sucked into the engine, we can have a fairly good idea of of, of how fast the engine is in t turning turning and how much air goes through it and, and the efficiency of the filter and all that sort of stuff. So, how effective would an, like an N95 mask be? You know, the the kind of mask that people use for flu pandemics and things, do um, those block What, you mean just those particles? little monkey, monkey masks, yeah. those little white things? No, they're, they're useless. Yeah, they're, they're that's useless. what I think. Too. You, have, you have to have, one, you have, to have a, a, a proper aerosol mask, like the sort of thing that you, you would buy for working with, with uh, dangerous aerosols. You know, like with, something with that carbon, seals carbon around your face. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You'd have to use that. And even that, even that won't, won't intercept some of these very small uranium particles that they use in... Yeah, that, that are created in, in, in weaponization. Those things are down in the 50 nanometer to 150 nanometer range, and they'll go straight through any of those things. So, so in fact, right... they go straight through the skin. What? They go straight yeah, through no, the skin? Yeah, yeah. They're, 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 the nanoparticles, uh, which is like a big deal now. Everybody's researching yeah. nanoparticles. I mean, nanoparticles go straight through the skin. That's how, they, that's how all these... Um, uh, yeah, these things that make, things, make yeah. women look younger, you yeah. know. They just put the paste on, it goes through the skin, it plumps the skin out and makes them look younger. But are you saying well, that, you, that they're, they're, they're radioactive uranium particles that are nano size that can... Yes, yes, penetrate? absolutely. They, they, oh, the Americans, when they were first developing this stuff, they did measurements at the... Uh, where is this somewhere in... Uh, it's, uh, they, have a, they have a base in America. I can't remember the name offhand anyway. So they did imp impact collections using various systems that, that measured the... the uh, the diameter so, of the particles. But basically what you're saying is we're, we're all screwed, is what you're saying. We're all screwed unless we can stop uh, this pollution. Unless we can stop these people using them. This, yes. is, this, is, the, this is why I say, well, somebody, I mean, I was, I was asked by Russia today to contribute to some program, and they said, what, and they, they, they said what's the most, most uh, serious radi radiation or, or nuclear hazard in existence at the moment? And they were talking about the strategic arms limitation talks, you know, and, and whether Iran is going to drop a bomb on, on Iraq and, or on um, Israel. But actually... This has been going on for a very long time. It already exists. The, the, most, the most serious item in this whole area is the refusal of the international committees that legislate about exposures to concede that there is a huge problem in right. there. Denial. That, that's Denial. it. That's it. Yeah. Well, uh, well, Dr. Busby, uh, we're out of time, but I want to thank you for joining me today. It's been a fascinating discussion. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we got to go. We got to go to break here. But uh, folks, Dr. Busby's web website is nuclearjustice.org. And thank you once again, Dr. Busby, for joining us. Okay. Thanks. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye.